Jeremiah 29, 11, a very famous verse. If you have a Christian picture frame plaque or t-shirt, it probably says that on it. Now, real quick, the verse says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and to give you a hope. Now, most people know that verse and we use that though, I think out of context to say, this is the college I want to go to, this is the boyfriend or girlfriend I want, this is the job I want, so those are my plans. So now God declares that and we don't understand that we're actually making ourselves central, not God. But we'll get to that in a minute. But a first thing we have to understand is we can't just take one verse out and kind of prostitute it out on our Facebook and our Twitter without looking at the narrative. What's going on? What's God trying to say? Who's the author? When was it written? Stuff like that. And also the fact that I think sometimes we take verses that God meant for a specific people at a specific time and then we then wretch it out of its context and use it for individual walk, which I don't know how I totally feel about that. Like for example, if a king were to say, you know, thousands of years ago, you know, that everyone in this land gets Twinkies. I don't know why I just picked Twinkies. 2,000 years later, if we saw that in the history books, would we read that and say, yes, that means I get Twinkies right now, right? <laughs> like, it, just, it doesn't make sense. Why? Because I was for a specific place, specific time. Now, that was kind of a bad example, RIP to the Twinkies, by the way. But what I'm trying to say with that is it's interesting that this declaration is over a nation, over a people. He declares the plans for Israel because of what they were going through at that moment. And so I think it's weird for us to rip it out and then say in my personal life, you know, X, Y, and Z. Now, does other scriptures talk about that God has a plan for us and he knows and he cares for our welfare and he's a father? Of course. But I'm just saying for this verse, let's just think about that carefully. Now, context. Context is huge. What's going on here? Now, Israel was in exile exile because of their disobedience and because they weren't repentant in their wrong ways to worship that God had asked them to do. They were in exile. Babylonians were pretty much lording over them. And then the temple was under siege, the thing that they saw as their national identity, right? Now, what's really interesting too, when in exile, verse seven is my favorite. Verse seven says, a couple verses up, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you, so into Babylon, into exile and pray to, to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Now, that's a really interesting verse that God says, seek the welfare in the city I've sent you into exile. You're not supposed to be there. Seek its welfare. Make the city beautiful so they might know me. They might know the God of the people that are making the place beautiful and seeking its welfare. Now, that's not really totally related to 11 at all. That was just kind of just a free nugget, but I guess YouTube's free, so this whole thing is free, but I just thought I would let you guys know that that's one of my favorite verses. But verse 11, now, real quick, we have to look at the verse before that if we really want to know what is going on there. So verse 10 is highly important. It says, for thus says the Lord. So this is right when he kind of goes into a speech and 11 is a part of it. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord and he goes on and on with verse 11 so first of all he's not saying that in the context of now right now it's all gonna get better he said 70 years you will be in exile longer 70 years some people don't even live 70 years and so I think what God's saying there is he we know that he has plans for us we know what he's doing but sometimes whether it's because of discipline or just because of suffering it might not happen right in that instant. They still had a lot of time in Babylon and they still were going to be in captivity for a good chunk of time. But then what's also really interesting is notice that he says, and then with that in mind, notice that he says, for I know the plans I have for you. I think a lot of times with this verse, we really prostitute God out, turn him into a Santa Claus or turn him into a genie from Aladdin, Robin Williams style, where we just say, we make our plans and then say, no, God, do them. God, make them. God, you are, those are my plans. And so what's interesting is about that is we make ourselves central and we're not. God is central and he has plans for us. And when we take our plans and project them onto him, then sometimes we can miss what God's doing. I mean, the person and work of Jesus is a classic example. This whole book is about the restoration of Israel, sending a Messiah, sending someone that will save them where God will become king and rule his people. And then who are the people that most rejected Jesus? The Israelites, the Jewish people, right? Jesus was the cornerstone that the builders rejected. And so if we're not careful, if we project what we believe onto God and say this is true, then we totally miss what he might be doing. Because the truth of this verse is even if you're healthy, sick, rich, poor, whatever it is, he has plans for your welfare. And it might not look like what you think, but because he's good and because he's God and because he's father, it will happen. And so that's what I want to leave you guys with today. Love you guys.